Hey what's up guys, this is Oakley and I'm going to bring you some information. So CA just released a developer blog number one on Total War Attila, so I'm going to come up with more and more of these periodically sort of tracing the development of Total War Attila, bringing us some new news, so it's I guess just a new, uh, maybe a, a new PR medium despite their, you know, they do their panoramics, they do their promo videos, and then they also do these developer blogs. It's a similar strategy to what we saw in Rome too. But in any case, this first one is going to start setting the tone for Total War Attila, and most of the information is not super new, however there are some small little uh, trinkets here and there that I picked up on, so I'll link below in the description if you want to go ahead and read the whole thing, otherwise we're just going to go over this really quickly. So as I said in the beginning, they just start talking about setting the tone, how the world is going to collapse, and you have East and Western Roman Empire splitting, they're degrading, and then the barbarians are pushing in and all that stuff, so they set, they paint the mood at first. And then they talk about how are they going to go ahead and present that mood in the game. So uh, moving on, yeah, they start talking about how, and this is where it starts to get a little bit more detailed. They talk about how they want to make this next Total War title perform more like a survival strategy game. And they say it right here, as opposed to the typical Total War game where it's nation against nation, um, and it's sort of fair and even distribution of kingdoms. You all start small, and then you sort of butt heads as you grow larger. Uh, in this one, they say... Um, Attila is not fair, it is not reasonable. So a, a decent amount of this is... Uh, I, it doesn't translate directly to gameplay, and a lot of this is just them throwing words at us, so it's hard to parse what this exactly means for gameplay. But if you look at this particular block of text that I pulled out, right here it says, Yet the horde may seem endless, and certainly when possible they will push on you and strain you to your very limits. The real question is how will you survive against the Hunnic multitudes? So that's very interesting. They're going to be focusing on the Huns, and as we've said in previous videos, it seems like, at least the direction for now, is the Huns are going to be unplayable, which means they're going to have a lot of particular behind-the-scenes mechanics to make them be this faction that you have to survive against. So a lot of stuff about uh, pertaining to the Seven Seals of the Apocalypse. Check out that video if you haven't already. But yeah, how that sort of builds and crescendos into the final Hunnic invasion, and then here, how they really want to push you and spread you thin and wear you out. So I think it's the, that's just them again talking about the new tone of the game and how they want to set it. But again, we're not really seeing the, 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 the ways that they're going to do that exactly. So we're going to have to wait on more news for that. Anyways, they do talk a little bit about some of the information that has been released so far. So for example, when they're talking about the destruction, the apocalypse, they talk about fire. Fire is something that can propagate. We've heard that before. So it'll be present in both sieges and normal battles. In sieges, Depending on um, how much besiegement the city has had, it may start with or without a fire at the beginning. Anyways, um, your troops can also set buildings on fire, either intentionally or not. So using fire arrows or low quality raiding troops will just automatically set buildings on fire as the attacker. That fire will then propagate throughout the map and it will have a deleterious effect on the defender's uh, morale. So they see their, their, their homes and their community burned down and they will lose hope. But uh, in your, if you're in the siege, you'll see sort of a meter telling you how much of the city is burned down, and with those stages of burning down, it'll confer uh, morale debuffs. And then also, apparently, on the battlefield map, if you have if you have um, certain forces that are hiding in the forest, or maybe even in some brush uh, type features, apparently you can set that on fire. The fire will then propagate, and then those units will initially not take damage. But then in the future, they didn't quite say will those units actually get burned, or will they just suffer a morale penalty? So we'll have to wait and see. I'm interested to really see this in action to kind of gauge what the dynamics of this are, um, because I could see how it could be exploited. Um, but honestly, my main concern is maybe even the graphical um, components of this. I mean, it's, it looks really cool, but uh, I just worry that it may be too much of a of a of a strain on lower end computers. But they have said that they've optimized the Rome 2 engine. And if you can run Rome 2 well, you should be able to run Total War Attila well. So uh, again, we have to start to see, or wait to see more metrics of that actually, uh, like literally in front of us in actual gameplay. And uh, hopefully they'll bring us some of that information soon. Uh, prolonging a little, or moving along and uh, sort of prolonging the discussion about sieges right here is going to be how they talk about the attrition system that's something we've covered before nothing particularly new here however I did pick out something uh, a little nugget right here which basically says that buildings in your settlement on the siege are going to be tied to buildings in your settlement on the campaign map so if you do damage to one in the campaign map it'll show up in the siege map likewise if you do damage to a building in the siege map that'll be reflected in the campaign map we already knew that but what you see here is them alluding to how agent actions can actually affect siege battles in terms of 
you know, if an agent does something on the campaign map, then it'll affect the settlement. So that's very interesting because obviously in previous games, you've been able to poison wells as a spy. You've been able to um, set fire to a certain buildings. So that would be kind of interesting if you go before a siege, you set fire to a building uh, with your spy, you do damage to it, and then you go into the campaign map or the, the battlefield map, and then the town is already burning and you can kind of see the building that you literally targeted the turn before with your spy. So that's kind of cool. And then it also opens the door for maybe there's other agent actions that you can have your agent do. So maybe instead of specifically targeting uh, a, a, an economic building inside the city, maybe you can send your spy in and tell him to unlock the gates or burn down the gates, or maybe you can tell him to burn down specific uh, bastion defenses, and then you go into the siege and then the gate is already burned for you. So I hope they do implement some of those dynamics. I did um, sort of miss the unlock the gate feature from previous Total War games, and uh, I th hope that's a better replacement to the mechanic that they had with throwing torches at the gate in Rome too. But again, we'll have to see sort of what the development on that is. We haven't seen anything to that regard, but again, I'm just picking out the little nuggets of information here. Moving along, they then talk about more of the destruction and the apocalyptic feel. So, of course, as I said before, the Huns are going to be driving in and it's a survival game. So one of the ways to survive is to use the um, Scorched Earth policy, and we've seen that before in video, and here's another image of it. So basically how it works is when you have a settlement, what you'll do is if you want to abandon it and not give it up to the enemy, what you can do is basically choose to destroy it and what happens is um, you get a certain amount of cash from basically you loot your own town and then you leave it and then the entire territory gets burned down the tile the tile for that uh, province becomes a blank des desolate tile and then uh, within that section basically you get reduced replenishment rates uh, reduced fertility and then there's no actual buildings in there and so if you want to go ahead and repopulate that area what you're gonna have to do is provide both men and money. So how that works is you bring in an army and once you decide to, I wanna colonize a settlement, you're gonna to have to start all the way from scratch with the city. And then once you do that, basically half of each of your units is gonna become a colonist and then it takes a certain amount of money. So as I said, you devote men and money. Now, if you just bring a small amount of men, like two, three units, then you're going to have to supply a large amount of money. If you bring a large amount of men, you're going to have to supply a small amount of money. So that's kind of cool um, because I can anticipate people bringing like huge low tier armies of peasants or levies and just sending those as like um, colonists. Essentially, you have a lot of men and they just become uh, the population pool for the city. So that's an interesting dynamic uh, and it's good to hear they're fleshing that out a little bit. But again, this is all kind of stuff we've heard before. Um, and then they go on and show some more images for this and they talk about how this is a strategic decision you can do if you don't want to relinquish territory to your enemy and whatnot. Um, so I do like that they're adding different elements to the campaign map uh, on what you can do to, to combat the, the enemy and just add more tools in your toolbox for this survival game. Um, and then basically that's going to be the end of it. They tease a little bit more information towards the end of the blog, like saying more is to come. So with that, I'm going to end the video basically. Um, so take those little nuggets of information. We'll have to wait to hear more. And then because there wasn't so much information in the blog, I did want to share with you my own little tidbit of information, not particularly relevant to um, the game itself, but it's a, it's a fascinating aspect of history that I thought I'd share with you. Um, and I'm going to start teasing this up a little bit. So basically, in you see uh, in this blog, you see CA portraying the barbarians as well, bloodthirsty barbarians, intent on revenge, intent on marauding, looting, and they paint this really dark, apocalyptic feel. Keep in mind that that's not actually very uh, reflective of the times. Yes, of course, there were massive invasions and a lot of warfare, but the barbarians weren't solely bloodthirsty, um, you know, uh, marauding people and. The, the, the interplay between the surviving empires and the uh, invading forces was not one of sort of a black and white good versus evil battle. You actually had a lot of internal um, nuance to this whole system. So, for example, what I'm about to share with you uh, speaks to that. So this may shock you. I'm going to start this off by telling you something that may shock you. And that is the fact that Attila was a Roman general at one point. So I'm just going to let that sink in. So the background for that is, obviously, there is a caveat to that. Um, Attila was made an honorary Roman general. However, he did not actually ever command Roman legions. So the backstory behind this is you look at the Western Roman Empire, and you have um, 
I believe it was uh, Valentinian at the time as the emperor. However, uh, there's a very strong general in his court, Flavius Aetius, and this was a very strong person in the court. He had a lot of power, major control over Rome's troops, uh, and he actually sort of was concerned mostly with Rome's holdings in Gaul and sort of almost carving out his, I won't say mini empire, but he was he was mostly in charge of that area. It's defense, he was heavily involved there, and he, he had a lot of support, but he wasn't the emperor. So um, he was actually early in his life sent over as part of a prisoner exchange to be with the, the, the Goths and with the Huns, I believe. And so in that time, he grew up with interfacing with some of Attila's uh, who would be later his his close advisor and stuff like that. So Flavius Aetius was a Roman who, as I said, was sent over as a sort of, um, a, not a prisoner exchange, but sent over as a, a something that's done been done throughout history is where you give up uh, political prisoners, the sons of nobles, to ensure uh, good relations. So he was sent over in that exchange, and he became sort of buddy-buddy with some of these Huns. And so when he grew up and later returned to the Roman Empire, he still had these interesting ties back to the Huns. And it makes for this really interesting nuance, especially when you have this general, Flavius Aetius, who has a power play going on between him and the emperor, and he's often jockeying for position. And actually what's pretty crazy is in order to secure his position, he even threatened to call in his Hunnic allies, his Hunnic friends, to come and you know secure his, his, his position. And he threatened, you know, if you try and take me out, I'm going to call my friends from across the, the, the Rhine, across the Danube, and they're going to come over. And so as part of this jockeying positioning, he was somehow able to, to force uh, Valentinian to confer the honorary rank of general to Attila. In doing so, Flavius Aetius was able to become officially, uh, in some capacity, he could claim Attila as his, his colleague. And in this relationship, it made it a little bit more easy for him politically to be able to say that, uh, oh, I will just call my uh, my fellow uh, you know, Roman general, um, Attila, to come help me. And so by sort of semi-legally making Attila part of this Roman um, mechanism, whatever, he's able to sort of um, have Attila serve his needs. Uh, now, of course, this was a two-way two -way street for Attila. Um, Flavius Aetius, as I said, was sort of occupied with Gaul, and in that area, he was fighting against the Goths. Same thing with Attila. Attila was fighting against the Goths, and so you have both fronts of Attila and Rome fighting against the Goths in between, and so it served both of their interests, at least for the time being, for Attila to help promote Flavius Aetius, and for Flavius Aetius to sort of try and help um, Attila, and both of them would try and converge on the Goths. So they had this weird, interesting power play between the two. Now, of course, in the end, uh, Flavius Aetius would finally end up fighting Attila, but it was sort of a, a marriage of convenience that you see happening. And it's just this nuance that I want to point out that really shows the dynamic aspects of this time period. And I hope that's not wasted on um, Total War Attila when you have seemingly the idea of the apocalypse and what could be a fight of good against evil. I just wanted to share with you that there is a tremendous amount of nuance to this story. This particular story that I just shared with you actually comes from uh, an excerpt from the book the End of Empire, Attila the Hun, and the Fall of Rome by Christopher Kelly. It's a very good read if you want to get introduced to this period. And it has a lot of these really cool anecdotes uh, written throughout it. So anyways, thanks so much. I hope you appreciated that little nugget of information. So now you can go ahead and proudly tell uh, your friends or people in the forums or comments that, uh, yeah, I mean, Attila was a Roman general. And you'll just see their jaws drop. And you can uh, you can actually see, the, see how they take it. Um, but now you have a little bit of the background. So again, the caveat is that uh, he was an honorary rank of Roman general. And he never actually commanded Roman troops. But technically, Attila was a Roman general. So anyways, it's a really cool part of history that I, I just love sharing with you guys. So anyways, hope you enjoyed. See you next time.